mad, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're live on Facebook. Thank you all for joining us today. What you hear in the background is uh, Rufus Harley from his album, his 1967 recording of uh, Etymology from the Recreation of the Gods. And thank you all so much for joining in. Thank you all for your patience and um, just for your time at this moment. So we're just gonna let this play through a bit. And um, again, just enjoy the tune before we get started our round table. So thank you so much. Again, that was Rufus Harley from his 1967, The Recreation of God's uh, Ethnology. And I hope that you all enjoyed the tunes. 1970. We're officially starting our round table. Uh, I would ask at this time, if you are not speaking, to just put your phones on mute so we won't pick up the background noises inside of your home. So we could just kind of keep it just a bit uh, focused on what it is that we're speaking about. So thank you all so much again for joining. And um, 
we're here to discuss uh, this 22 year, 22 year old archived live concert uh, recorded at Spivey Hall with Rufus and his son, Messiah Patton Harley. And um, we are here to discuss and speak about the album, the inspiration behind reproducing it and where we are. And we have a few um, round table discussers on the line today. But before we begin, I would like to uh, share my screen with you all so that Rufus could just give a brief uh, uh, introduction of who he is and in his own words. So uh, uh, give me a moment. Hi, my name is Rufus Harley, the world's first and only jazz bagpiper and saxophonist. Freedom is ringing on Jazz City, so stay in tune. Like I say, life goes on. And um, I was inspired to get into the bagpipes by watching the burial services of the late President Kennedy. And uh, I looked in all of the pawn shops here around here in Philadelphia, and I couldn't find a set. So I called all the pawn shops in New York City, and I found this good set of hardy pipes. By not knowing anything about pipes, I found a good set of hardy pipes in the uh, pawn shop in New York. Of course, the pawn broker thought that I was sort of going kooky at that time, back in the 60s. And when I first saw the bag, I said, well, it wouldn't be really nothing to the instrument, nothing but a bag and a bunch of sticks. The flute was hard, the oboe was hard, the soprano, the alto, the tenor, you know, all of them was rough instruments. So I tried to blow the bagpipes up and um, I couldn't get a sound out of it. Then I realized that, hey, this is really going to be rough. So I gave the pawnbroker back the bagpipes, took my $120 and began to leave New York City. But right as I got out the door, I heard a voice say it was probably me talking to me, and it usually is, and uh, say, go back and get, get the bagpipes. You had problems at first, and uh, you can do it. So I went back and got them and took them home, start practicing. Of course, the neighbors and everybody thought they couldn't believe hearing bagpipes in the ghetto of Philadelphia. So the cops would come to the house and say, I'm sorry that we have a complaint that there's bagpipes being played here. And I would get away by saying, do I look like I'm Irish or Scottish to you? And they would politely say that I thought there was a crank call and then they would bow out gracefully and leave me alone until I started making a lot of local television shows like the International Council of Churches on Channel 10. And I made a, some shows like To Tell the Truth, I Got a Secret, and What's My Line, and uh, the Steve Allen Show, the Johnny Carson Show, I call it back in the day when I first started. And, uh, and so now it cannot be hitting in anymore. In fact, I just did the uh, Arsenio Hall Show, and that was about two weeks ago. I'm quite sure a lot of folks out there saw it. And uh, we came up with three threes. And I'm very happy about that because three is about being free. And uh, here I am now, uh, being the world's first and only jazz bagpiper. I have been able to go to uh, Scotland and Ireland. And uh, I kissed the Blarney Stone in Ireland and blowing the bagpipes on Blarney's Castle. Blarney's Castle is a castle that goes back to the uh, 11th and 12th century that represents the Irish culture. In fact, they have adopted me as one of their <clears throat> spiritual pipers, brothers. My name is now Mac Harley you know, Mac Rufus Harley, which Mac means a son of. And then I went on to uh, Germany and while they was tearing down the Berlin Wall, I presented them with the Liberty Bell on national television, uh, representing their freedom. And um, I was able to go to uh, Moscow last year 
and uh, perform on the first international Moscow Jazz Festival. I was able to take the Liberty Bell to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, take the Liberty Bell to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Moscow and uh, present it to the uh, uh, Russian people and uh, to Grobachev. Of course, I had to send his through the embassy. But, uh, and then I've been able to be very successful of taking this bell around the world. I have presented this bell to the, uh, to the president of the United States, President uh, Bush, to the, and the president Mitterrand of France, and uh, to South Africa. Uh, I've, I have presented it to the, um, <clears throat> the people in South Africa. And uh, I'm telling you, it's just, uh, it's just a trip. So now I need to be what I have been continuing to be, the world's first international ambassador of culture and freedom. Okay. Thank you so much for that, um, for tuning into that. And Rufus is, uh, you know, discussing his life and what it is that he was successful with. So thank you all again for sitting and tuning in and joining. So now I'm going to introduce our round table discussers. And we have, of course, myself, Sister Noah Harmony. We have my brother, America Patton Harley. We have Sister Tomiko uh, Shine. We have uh, brother David Duncan. And we have my sister, Egypt on the line joining us today. And if any any time that you want to join in Egypt, you can feel free to join in. And um, OK, I'm here. And uh, America, you can probably introduce yourself if you would like, or I don't know how you all feel. Would you want, want me to introduce you, introduce you? Or you can say just a little bit about yourselves. I can read your bios. <laughs> you can introduce this fine. I'm fine with it. OK. So America Patton Harley, the second youngest son of Rufus Harley Jr. Uh, America graduated from J.C. Herman High School in 2000. He received his Associates of Arts degree from Coffeyville Community College and a Bachelor of Arts degree in 2006. In 2010, Patton received his master's degree in curriculum and instruction from the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Patton is a proud candidate uh, AmeriCorps, alum AmeriCorps alumni. Patton loves spending time with his creative daughter, Gracie, teaching, giving back to others, sports, music, reading, writing, traveling, spending time, connecting with nature, family, historical preservations, and fitness, health and fitness. 10 years from now, Patton plans to continue working with the Underground Railroad, historic preservation, and Quindor Quindaro Candace to continually develop solutions to solving environmental problems. He also plans to pursue a PhD or doctorate degree in curriculum and instruction or in constitutional law and service learning or in educational ministry. In summary, in the future, Patton hopes to be married, to continually grow in his faith, to become a better father, mentor, coach, teacher, reader, writer, historian, speaker, athlete, and servant. He also hopes to continue to grow as a musician. Patton's lifelong goal is to be a miracle, a miracle to someone each day he journeys throughout the world. So we have Sister Tomiko Shine. Um, and this is, these are just some brief uh, bios of each roundtable discusser because, you know, this is just that platform. So Tamako Shan, the cultural curator for the Rufus Harley Foundation Incorporated, she works to place the musical philosophy and worldview of Rufus Harley and the global conscious, global collective consciousness. As a cultural anthropologist, founding director of Agent People in Prison Human Rights Campaign, Be More Literacy Tours, and author. As a cultural anthropologist, her research has led to community activism and building on behalf of people of African descent. In 2017, Ms. Ms. Shine participated in the UN Decade of People of African Descent Regional Meeting in Geneva, Switzerland as a civil as a civil society representative of North America, 
given testimony on the platforms of justice and development. Ms. Shine writes analytical reports for various national and international organizations and agency who work to preserve and protect families of African descent and around the world. We also have David Duncan. He started learning Scottish Highland bagpipes at age 12 in his hometown of Tuscan, Arizona. He played the traditional Scottish style pipe bands for almost 20 years and completed inter and competed internationally with multi-grade one appearances at the World Pipe Band competitions in Glasgow, Scotland. In addition to playing Scottish Highland bagpipes, he also plays German medieval bagpipes. In 2014, he started an experimental performance based bagpipe band called the Freestylers of Piping and cites Rufus Harley as a major influence on his approach to writing non-traditional original bagpipe music. In 2020, he began studying jazz music on Highland bagpipes with the intention of honoring the legacy of and bringing awareness to the music of the late Rufus Harley. He currently resides in Los Angeles, California, where he works as both a professional musician and a full-time motion graphics designer. I'll speak a little bit about myself as well. <laughs> Sometimes that could be a bit hard to do, but uh, Sister Noah Harmony, which is myself, the youngest daughter of Rufus Harley, a student businesswoman and futurist, the executive, executive director for the Rufus Harley Foundation Incorporated, a Philadelphia native, began her entrepreneurial journey as the founder and president of DC Staffing LLC and Magnolia Park Group, existing since 2014. With over 15 years of work and experience, she has produced, managed, collaborated, and brought innovative ideas to some of Washington, DC's largest events. Partner with local and federal governments, small and disadvantaged businesses, national and international organizations like UNESCO, the United Nations, educational, scientific, and cultural organization. Through this, she has worked closely alongside with prime ministers, ambassadors, representatives from the U.S. Capitol, senators, excuse me, senior staff and staffers from the U.S. State Department, direct leaders of the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and Pentagon. Sister Noah Harmony holds a bachelor's of business administration from the University of District of Columbia, Currently, she is a student at the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music, a music industry essentials program at NYU, fulfilling her purpose as a creative entrepreneur and futurist, cultivating music, art, business, and technology in this 21st century. So as you see, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very <laughs> vast amount of knowledge and experience and understanding of ourselves as individuals in this world and how it is that we can incorporate our understanding and our experience and bring it forth in this collective consciousness of our world and surrounded around the Rufus Harley Foundation legacy. So thank you all again for joining us and um, we're here. So we're going to move to the next uh, agenda on our script and this is uh, the Keys of Justice. This is one of the songs from the Keys of Justice album. And this song is called We Free. And um, if we could have that be played by uh, America, that would be great. And while America's getting all of that together so we don't waste any airtime, if you all will be so kind, if you all have any information about the legacy of Rufus Harley, you can check out our website at www.rufusharley.com. That is where we you can be updated with all of the things that we're doing as you know the legacy of Rufus Harley and knowing more information about the foundation and how it is that we're moving ahead and just continuing Rufus Harley's legacy in this 21st century. So Thank you all so much in America. You can, um, you know, present the keys of justice and, you know, just say a little bit about that as well. Yes, here's uh, our album. Uh, of course, this is our promotional copy of our CD. Uh, it'll be available uh, download here uh, very soon for uh, 
anybody who would like to download the album. But uh, here goes our promotional copies. Uh, you're welcome to, you know, get, get in contact with us uh, via our RufusHarley.com, RufusHarley.com, uh, or you can reach out to Bill Anchel. Uh, dot com and uh, he will get in contact with us and uh, we will gladly mail you a CD or if you're here locally in Kansas City they're on sale uh, for $20 um, down at the wax factory here off of 33rd and parallel in KCK it's $20 it's a two CD set you have the front and the back cover here this is the artwork originally artwork done by our father here uh, and then he's his, his original artwork then you have the his original design of the artwork here on this album here was released, uh, actually was rec recorded live on the campus of Clayton State University in 1998 um, with the Bill Anchel trio. Uh, many of you guys know Bill Anchel is, a, is in the Jazz Hall of Fame in Seattle, Washington as a pianist. And then you also have uh, Neil Starkey on bass, who's uh, also internationally known. And then our father on the bagpipes and baby soprano saxophone. And uh, we also have my uh, older brother, Messiah, who's on trumpet and uh, flugelhorn on here. So this is a live concert, which originally uh, recorded on cassette tape. Uh, and then also it was recorded uh, by the basses on a CD. So we were able to capture both the cassette tape and also the CD. And we were able to uh, fully restore the album. And as you know, this is a two CD set, you know, and it's a great deal. You know, if you open up, I won't share all of the goodies, but you know, if you open up, it's a two CD set. You can have the liner notes. I'll show you a little bit of that. And uh, I don't want to show you the whole piece, but go ahead and purchase it. And then you'll get a chance to see the liner notes personally written by myself here. Uh, it's a two CD set, uh, great price, $20, uh, which is going to help us with the Rufus Harley Foundation and to help us to try to generate some type of revenue so we can get the Rufus uh, Harley Foundation up and running very strongly so we can have funds to where we can offer scholarships and to different youth who would like to uh, major in music or want to study at the bagpipes and we have uh, so many ideas with that which we'll discuss with you guys at a later date but uh, please pick this up you guys will love it so we saved our father's voice this is the first cd those of you guys who still want to learn more about rufus harley uh, uh, the world's first jazz bagpipe player our, our late father um, this is a great album because we saved his voice and everything. We saved his personality. We captured him in that raw moment of uh, probably in 1998, a few years before he passed in 2006, of prostate cancer. Uh, so I also want to put this out there too. Healthcare for jazz musicians, please come up with some great alternatives for uh, full-time jazz musicians to get them quality healthcare because many of them could make it into their 80s and 90s. <laughs> And our father was really close with getting health care, um, but he, uh, you know, was, he was a little bit older at the time. He wasn't able to get the quality health care that he needed. So, so health care for jazz artists, uh, good discounts or something, those doctors out there <laughs> and all of those policymakers. Uh, so let me go ahead and I'm going to play a song off of the album. This is the original composition. Um, of course, we're not going to play the whole album, but we can play some of his original work and some of the music that was written before 1924. Uh, and, and once we have available on download online. You can hear the rest of the album. But here goes a portion of the CD, Live at Spivey Hall, Rufus Hardy and Son, featuring the Bill and Child Trio. Can you guys have any questions? Please put those in the inbox during the presentation, during the conversation, or also this, uh, you feel free to ask them now. And I'm pretty sure uh, my sister Noah will see those questions and we will get to those questions if you have some. Rufus Hardy's son, live at Spivey Hall at Clayton State University in Morrow, Georgia. Oh, we free, and that's French, O-U-I. Thank you. 
Thank you guys for listening. That's uh, All We Free, Rufus Harley and Son, live at Bobby Hall uh, with uh, Ken Boto on drums. And we have Neil Starkey, that's S-T-A-R-K-E-Y, Bill Anchell, B-I-L-L-A-N-S, uh, right? Bill Anchell, A-N-S-C-H-E-L-L. -L. So, and uh, those are all of our musicians who are on the album. So it's again, Bill Anchell, uh, if you guys haven't heard of him, please uh, check out his music, Bill Anchell, B-I-L-L-A-N-S-C-H-E-L-L, -L -L, Bill Anchell, and Neil Starkey, Ken Aboto, Messiah Harley, uh, Trump and Flugelhorn, and our late father, Rufus Harley. Um, support those musicians, guys. I repeated it several times intentionally, <laughs> not to sound like a broken record. So I want you to support those guys. They're fabulous musicians. They're amazing. And uh, they're just uh, working really hard to keep jazz and the music alive. So support live mm -hmm. jazz, support mm -hmm. the music. And uh, we will greatly pre uh, appreciate this. This is a treasure. This is like a, a historical gem, uh, you know, kind of like a little, like a diamond you know, in a rough, you know, you find it underneath the earth and, uh, and it, then you clean it off and everything. This is, this is what this type of album is. And it's a uh, one of a kind guys. Um, you won't go wrong by keeping it and uh, archiving it in your artifacts and hold it onto it. Um, and then learn, you have, you also have opportunity to learn a lot from um, our late father, Rufus Harley, as well as all of these other musicians. Um, this is their, some scholarly work here and we would love uh, for you guys to support them and just keep the music flowing. Thank you for listening. I'll hand it back over to Noah. All right, thank you, America, for that. Um, and we can now open our panel. Well, not our panel, our round table of discussion. This is one of the, the songs featured on the album. And uh, we can hear from Sister Tomiko, the cultural curator for the Rufus Harley Foundation and David Duncan, uh, a freelance bagpiper uh, specializing on Highland bagpipes and just give your, uh, you know, your feedback on that album, um, that actually, the actual track, uh, We Free. And how does it resonate to you? And, you know, just give us your understanding about what do you all think about it? I can go ahead and go. Uh, do you want me to go ahead and go first, David? Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, such a, a pleasure. Um, always enjoy listening to uh, Rufus Harley because it's the collaboration of tones, rhythms, and his voice, um, and always a message in the music. Uh, so I really appreciate that always, no matter how many times I hear. But um, as a cultural curator as the Rufus, of the Rufus Harley Foundation, uh, my role is to make sure that uh, the music of Rufus Harley is articulated um, and explained and overstood in such a way that it reaches the far corners of the earth, but also the far corners of people's minds. And so um, as I listen to that and listen to the album, you know, it's so appropriate for Rufus Harley, as I mentioned his voice in the beginning, he was telling us he was inspired by watching Kennedy um, and the black watch pipers that played. Um, and just a few days before Jackie Kennedy, Jackie O, as who's later was known, she had them come and play for her and her family on the White House lawn with about 1,700 children. Um, but later she called them again when her husband was assassinated. And so uh, Kennedy was very significant to black people at that time. In most people's home, they had a picture of Kennedy and a picture of Martin Luther King in their home because black people struggled, suffered uh, for many centuries. And so at this time, when Rufus Harley saw this uh, funeral procession, these, these jazz bagpiper, bagpipers at that time, he made it jazz later. He was 27 years old, coming of age um, at this time. At 19 years old, he witnessed or uh, saw the death um, and pictures of Emmett Till. Um, so all of this led together, I believe, to Rufus Harley of that of his path to seeking justice. And so this was a grave injustice of Kennedy at the time, the assassination and the others that followed. And so when he says, you know, we free and this, this appropriate album at this time, the keys of justice to go, how do you go from a maintenance worker, which is basically a janitor working for housing to an international jazz bagpiper. And I think it was his path to justice and seeking freedom 
um, more than what he was supposed to be, you know, outside of the definition of a manufactured a systemic role, he began to travel the world and that's what the bagpipes did. They took him around the world. He saw different versions of freedom and that it was a possibility. So when he says "Re free, that's like, a, that's like a call. And that's what the bagpipe says. It is a, a chant. It's like a prayer. Um, when he took up those bagpipes, he was no different than the ancestors before him on the plantations of Duluth, Georgia, uh, Alabama, Texas. They were calling out to their, their savior, to the God, to the divine one for freedom. And he did the same thing every time he took those bagpipes. So when he said we free, he's trying to get us to change our mind, and particularly uh, Africans, um, to experience something different, to think something different and become that. And that's what uh, Rufus Harley did uh, so fabulously. You know, blacktastic, as we're using the word now. He was blacktastic with it. Um, and so that's, that's kind of my thoughts, um, thinking about that, listening to that uh, Sister Noah in America. Um, that uh, that was a message and it's more appropriate even more so now. So he's right on time as usual and usual we behind him. That was done in 1998, <laughs> the album, this is 2020 and we're still trying to catch up uh, to the depth of what it means to be free and, and justice. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Tomiko. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, David, would you like to say something? Sure, yeah, um, such a pleasure to be here. Um, we really appreciate you know this whole thing being put together and um yeah this uh this track in particular we free um was i mean i was at the um the previous discussion the keys of justice discussion and i remember hearing this one i got so excited because um you know it kind of reminds me of like the the up tempo like um tracks from like john coltrane's like giant steps album like mr pc and countdown it's just got this rip roaring like you know fast like bop tempo and i just i got so excited because I, I loved hearing what rufus did when he put the bagpipes in the jazz context and like you know um so yeah so when i when i heard him like soloing on on this on this track i was really excited and um yeah it's uh you know i think um uh, you know i've been studying jazz and um you know i come from a traditional uh scottish uh approach to bagpipes and um you know there's one thing i wanted to point out about like um rufus's um sort of technique is that um you know in the bagpipes we 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 have a traditional scale and um you know, uh, it includes a C sharp, which is like a major sounding interval. But what Rufus did was he played the C natural, which is, um, you know, this is a C sharp right here, and this is a C natural. And what that does is it brings it into this minor pentatonic mode, which is, you know, kind of the main modal expression of like um, blues and jazz music, which is um, not traditional, obviously, you know, the traditional sound is this major modal kind of thing. But when Rufus took it and flipped it and made it, you know, bluesy and jazzy it just it just completely changes the sound and the you know the character of the instrument and I, I remember hearing it for the first time and just being like just blown away because it's kind of frowned upon to venture outside of the tradition within the Scottish practice in fact I mean like it's you know it's kind of saved for after hours and you know it's not really what you know what you want to you know show your teacher it was when you're we're practicing these untraditional you know scales and fingerings and stuff like that but yeah but rufus took it and just took it to the next level and um i was so inspired when i first heard him doing what he did and just blown away that this you know this creative man was doing this you know in the 60s you know like i mean it's just yeah so i mean i'm you know i <laughs> i love rufus's music and it was so exciting for me to hear uh we free um this track really resonated with me thanks I wanted to mention too, uh, David, it's interesting you talk about the modification um, and how he did that. And I think that was a part of Rufus Harley freeing himself. You know, how you said done after hours. I think that uh, he needed to do that. And I think the bagpipe uh, was a passport to help, but he had to, and him modifying it, uh, he was able to redefine himself. And especially in the 60s, I think, you know, we say he went into the owner shop, owner shop looking like he was kooky. Black man, 1967, you walk in a New York shop in the heart of the civil <laughs> rights movement, people being bashed in, protests everywhere. And this black young man walking in, you know, you poor, you black, you from Philly, and you say you want something from a Scottish culture. He said, first of all, mm -hmm. how do you even know anything about this? Um, and so it just shows that, you know, the path of freedom um, through this instrument, it, 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 it's internal, it's like an internal revolution. And then, as you say, he physically had to go through that modification. Yes. 
And I just, you know, the words courageous or courage comes to mind when I think about Rufus in that scenario, you know, going to this pawn shop in New York City in the middle of the civil rights movement, being who he was and, you know, and with the intention that he had too, it's like, it's, it's just, I mean, yeah, I know he had an album called Courage too. So, you know, right. that is significant as yeah, well, I think. <laughs> Because, you know, at that time, you know, Black people, especially Black men, you were had to stay in the shadows. You, this is, this is what racism does. You are not allowed to be fully human. You have to stay in the shadows. You're not allowed to participate in life. You cannot say anything. You cannot do nothing different. And so for him, this was um, a journey. And I believe in that moment, um, unbeknownst to him, I think he became an ambassador uh, for people of African descent. Um, but also I think his message went to all the different cultures later. And I think he moved from being just black to becoming African because to be African is to be a, a global citizen. Because Africa at one time was the, is still the ambassador to the world. So he kind of, um, I can't even imagine him going in there. I, I know the guy was like, what in the heck is this coming in here? But it was very timely. He was on time as usual. We still behind, right? Um, he was still, and we're still trying to interpret this man. Oh, sorry, we got carried away. <laughs> oh, no, it's it's fine. You know, this is a roundtable discussion on uh, Rufus Harley. And again, let us just be reminded of where we are. We're here today. Today is the 14th year anniversary of Rufus Harley transition. And um, he, di uh, he passed away in 2006 uh, due to some complications with prostate cancer. However, we're here 14 years later still speaking of his rich legacy that he left behind. And with the music, you know, what they say, the famous quote, people die, but music never dies. So we have him here and we're discussing him 14 years later, which is such a, an awesome thing because exactly what he's speaking about over his 40, 50 year career before he transitioned, it's so relevant for today. So, you know, um, as we continue onward, even after this round table discussion, let us continue to keep, you know, our ancestor Rufus Harley and our spirits and keep them high vibe and, you know, just continue to, you know, send them love because uh, we know that he is still with us. He's not here physically presently, but he's here in the spirit. So um, with this, everyone that is on this panel today, it's a blessing, it's a blessing. So. You know, thank you all again so much just to, again, be reminded why, why August the 1st is such a special day. A lot of things have happened in August and, you know, again, our, <laughs> our culture curator could, you know, just touch a little bit about some things uh, historically, nationally and internationally that has happened in the month of August. And my dad uh, transitioned August 1st, uh, 2006. So, you know, it's just the beginning of a lot of uh, great things within this month. So again, thank you all for joining. Uh, now, as where we are on our agenda, we are going to listen to the, inter the etymology, excuse me, adversity to change and interconnectivity. Um, and also the etymology and philosophy and dialogue of Rufus Harley. So, um, my brother America, who is the DJ for the day, <laughs> if you could uh, play uh, that next portion of the discussion so that we can just hear that from the Keys of Justice album, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. And, and I just wanted to add this. Um, we didn't plan this, but today is actually, uh, well, uh, going to the 31st and the 1st of August, um, those days there. Uh, it's Emancipation Day in, in Canada, the day that they celebrate where Blacks, you know, were freed. And, uh, you know, uh, that's the day that our father transitioned was August 1st on Emancipation Day, you know, the 31st and the 1st leading up to the day they have huge celebration that goes all the way back, you know, to like the 1800s, I believe so, and, uh, and throughout Canada. And they're still celebrating right now, you know, um, they have events throughout the whole nation. And I thought that was pretty interesting that, you know, we were playing that song, Wake Up, We Free. We didn't plan it. And we were talking about freedom and emancipation. And that, uh, you know, that's the day that they celebrate emancipation throughout uh, 
Canada. Uh, that was pretty awesome. I know ours is a little bit earlier in the year when we celebrate ours, but in the United States, but all of it connects together. I thought that was, wasn't coincidence. We didn't plan that. <laughs> so let me go ahead and get this ready for you guys. And here goes our father's voice explaining his um, pretty much how the bagpipes are connected, interconnected with. Um, well, we're going to go into that next one. We're going to go into uh, adversity change and interconnectivity first, Noah. Yes, America. Okay. Yeah. So one, this, one, okay. one uh, technical uh, 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 modification. If you could, when you play, I don't know if you have a CD player or if you could bring the speaker closer to your speaker so that we can clearly hear. Um, okay. A absolutely. Yep. I, I can bring a little bit closer. And um, so, yeah, this song here, this is our father explaining the interconnectivity. Uh, the change of the bagpipes and some of the adversity that he faced, uh, you know, when playing the bagpipes. Uh, live is Fabi Hall. Pretty cool to see players like record players nowadays. <laughs> Pretty historical. All right, you guys, here we go. Very historical. <laughs> Thank you very much for holding on. I just refuse for the bagpipes to strength my horn out of my hand completely, you know? So this is the bagpipes, okay? Now running off at the chops, come along with it. Just, and all this sound working on you, it's forced you to start thinking, you know? <clears throat> now the bagpipes, this is a set of Scottish regimental pipes. I got them out of a pawn shop in New York. I was watching the burial services of the late President Kennedy and I heard the bagpipes and I said, wow, I wish it was something that I could do, you know, playing saxophone. So why not bagpipes? So I called all the pawn shops and I finally found this set. It's the same original set. And this, these are a set of Harley pipes. And uh, <clears throat> I like that because it sounds like Harley, Rufus Harley, you know what I mean? I like where that one's moving in, you know? So when I went in the pawn shop to get it, there was a Jewish pawnbroker in there. He says, I said, you got a set of bagpipes. I called from Philadelphia. He said, bagpipes? He says, you sure you're in the right place? I said, yeah, I'm, you know. No, no. So he brought the pipes out, set them on the table. I said, oh, I ain't nothing to this because I felt I played flute too, the open hole flute, you know? I said, wow. I thought if you can play flute, you can play any instrument, man. Flute is really hard, you know. So I tried to pick it up and blow it. Boy, it was rough. So I said, no, I, I don't, I don't want to bother with this, you know. And uh, took my $120 back and walked out the door and I heard a voice say, Rufus, so you know how that inner self be talking to you and stuff, you know. Rufus, go back and get the bagpipes. I said, it's just, this is what you really want me to do? Yeah, Rufus, you know, like that old Moses shit was going on, you know what I mean? Go back and get the bagpipes. You know you had a hard time with the other instruments. You can do it. Oh, shit. Okay, so I went on back in there. I said, well, at least if I don't blow it, I can be hip and tell the musicians, well, I got to set bagpipes home hanging on the wall, you know? So I got into, as soon as I walked in the door, my wife thought I was going crazy. I was married at that time. She left me. It's true, it's true. Yeah, this is true. This is true. I ain't even got started with this, you know. Called her mother and said, you going crazy. And then she left me. Then as I began to experiment with the bagpipes to bring them up to date, the neighbors start calling the cops on me. So when I heard the cops driving up one night, Knocked on the door, I went to the door. Say, I'm sorry, uh, we have a complaint that there's bagpipes being played here. I say, in this house, do I look like a Scottishman or Irishman to you? <laughs> truthfully, truthfully. I say, why was some bagpipes being here? He said, I thought it was a crank call. And then he went on about it, you know. You know? Okay. That's some of the stuff I go to. And then they asked me sometime, this happened about last year, you know. 
Which part of Ireland are you from? I'm from the American part. I'm an American, so that makes me Irish, Scottish, Jewish, African. Just about the mere fact of me saying it, Asian, the mere fact of me relating to it makes me what it is, if you can dig it. So that got him off my butt, okay? All right, to the pipes. Now, this is called the chanter. This is the part that plays the melody. When I went to Scotland and Ireland, they asked me, what did I do to the bagpipes? I said, I just taught her how to speak English. That's all. Here we go. Now, this is the part that plays the melody. So this is a little bit English. It's never been done before, okay? So now we stick it in the bag. And it's the mother instrument, you see? And the Queen of England got a piper, gets up every morning. He has to play the pipes before the sun comes up. That's a steady gig. I wish I had that one, you know? Man, <laughs> shit, you know? So now I play the bagpipes on the right side. So when I was in Scotland and Ireland, they said, uh, Mr. Harley, uh, like, uh, you're playing the bagpipes wrong. I said, how is that? You notice, because they play on the left. I want you to notice this whenever you see them marching, you know? So I said, how is that? He said, well, you're playing them on the wrong side. You know, you're supposed to play on the left. I said, I'm playing on the right. That makes me right. What's wrong with you, you know? So I said, I'll tell you what. Stop and think about this. Over here, y'all are driving on the right-hand side. And in the States, we're driving on the left-hand side. So in the States, I'm playing the bagpipes on the right-hand side. And they're all over here playing the bagpipes on the left-hand side. So therefore, we got balance. Any questions about that, just let me know, okay? All right. Now, we have to blow the pipes up and make it say, Mommy. You have to realize. You know, you know the, the drone say, oh, like those Buddhist monks, you know, playing those long horns. But only the bagpipes got the melody to go along with it. Somebody must have stuck it in a water bag or something like that, you know? Like I said, they found it buried in Egyptian tombs. The bagpipes got to Scotland and Ireland when the Moors took them over there. They opened up castles and so on. And uh, they had fights over the bagpipes because they was turning out so many scholars like me, you know. So they got to going through a lot because the bagpipes got a way of, of, of just growing on you. You know what I mean? I'm, I got to hurry up. I got to blow it up. Over here. Now, here we go. Now, once I get a good ma, then I'm going to bring the me in. You dig? This is the me down here, and this is the ma up here. So I'm going to show you now. You got to get that ma now. I'm going to show you what I'm talking Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, America. Oh, so much richness inside of just that one clip right there. And it's a, it's a, some of it is a repeat of what we've already mentioned, but just hearing it from Harley's mouth just makes it so more grander. <laughs> and um, as you all can see, he probably was also a comedian on his downtime from the bagpipes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, such a beautiful thing, such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, if you all want to chime in to speak about anything that he mentioned or not, we can move on to the next uh, etymology, philosophy and dialogue of Rufus. So you all can chime in whenever it is that you feel like it. Okay. So we're gonna to go to the etymology and philosophy and dialogue. America, if you could uh, play that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks, bro. Thanks, bro. Thank you. You know, uh, this horn was given to me uh, from some people that was, uh, you know, in Paris from Holland. And I was playing in Paris and I was working in a club and, and I was having problems out of my straight soprano because I was playing, you know, playing tenor and straight soprano. 
And they said, well, we got one home you can have. I said, well, really? So they brought this in the next night and they gave it to me. I said, well, what am I going to do, do with this? Because like a great Dane jumping on a chihuahua, you know what I mean? <laughs> really, really. The stuff I got to go through just to do it, you know what I mean? Whew. Then I brought it home. And my son, Messiah, that must have been about four or five years. He thought he thought I was a play toy. He's going to start playing with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and it really, this is a baby soprano saxophone. And it's really interesting. And this is, you know, this is really what an American is. Like, here I am in Paris giving, now the sax was created by the Germans, Adolf Sachs, okay? Given to me by some people from Holland in Paris, and this one was made by the Japanese people, it's a Yamaha. <laughs> Sometimes I, I wonder. And when I get into the bagpipes, it really gets deep then, you know what I mean? You see? So to be an American is really to be all nationality. Be proud to be an American because that's really what it's all about, our language. Our language mm -hmm. has got us all hooked up in there together because the real musical instrument is the human anatomy. Say, for instance, we is really French for yes. We put English on it and made it something else, you know, but it's still French. Kindergarten is German. So when you say kindergarten, you actually speak in German. Arabic is, Arab, I mean, algebra is Arabic, you know what I mean? Linen is Russian. Say my bed linen and on and on. I know y'all didn't ask for this, but this is what comes along with the bag. You know what I mean? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just time to wake up. That's all. To be an American is to be all of these things. And that's what it's all about. Thomas Jefferson said that we're not going to have any harmony until everybody speak one common language. And that's this language in which we're speaking right now. And that's the language that's got us all locked in. Not how we look and all like that. Do you know how what we had to go through to stand up and bird turd and bullshit one another, you know what I mean? And go through all these changes, you know? Ooh, it took a lot of work. But now we all in tune. But now it's time for us to understand. Remember, the word America is A-M-E. -A, that's the me. And then you got that R-I-C, you know, the original C. I like it. Einstein calls it E equals MC squared. That's from the left to the right. Now, you come from the right to the left, because I'm going to be blowing the bagpipes on the right side. See me. That's what you get from the right to the left. Just see me. And we know what the square is, all of it. Okay? As we go along, we will finish these human music lessons to get us in tune. You know what I mean? Because that's what this is. It's a therapy to get us together because the whole world is counting on the American to respect their investment. Here we go. <clears throat> now we're going to continue with this next tune. And I'm going to keep it simple for you. And this is when you wish upon a star and make those wishes because they might come true. Thank you, guys. You know, that's Rufus Harley in rare form and just speaking regarding his inspiration behind the bagpipes and his idea, philosophy behind it and um, what he and how he has um, let's say, uh, evolved over time from his first conception of adopting the bagpipes as a jazz instrument until the time in which it was a live concert in 1998. And you just can hear, if you go back into some of his older archives of music from the 60s and 70s until 1990, you know, the, his evolution was just, uh, just great. And um, it was unheard of. So. If you all would like to mention again anything about what he was speaking about or if you can understand some of his philosophy if you don't or you know just where you think that i guess as uh being here uh uh african descent we have uh americans on the line we have so many nationalities and descents from on the line if you all could just speak a, a little bit about uh where it is that you feel and how it is that you uh, registered what he was speaking about um, just then. So if you all would like to speak, if not, we could play some more of Rufus's music. And we could talk a little bit about the Rufus Harley Foundation and where we're heading with that. So 
you know, we're coming to a close in just a little bit with our round table. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to speak on it. I mean, you know, um, hearing, you know, Rufus's philosophies is one of the most enlightening, you know, things about this um, CD for me and his worldview in which I know um, on our last discussion, America was saying that he sewed the, the flags of the world into his bag. And, you know, to me that kind of, you know, I mean, it just, he just seemed to have this passion for bringing people together, you know, and, um, you know, uh, taking something out of its cultural context and then bringing new people into it. It was kind of seemed to me to be kind of what he was doing with the bagpipes. And, you know, he was using them to unite. And I think that's just, you know, such a beautiful thing. I mean, I, yeah, I, I you know, it, it um, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's all I got on that. It, it, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot more to it, but um, I'd love to, I'd love to learn. <laughs> I just um, had a few uh, had questions for uh, Tom McCorn and also David. Just uh, how do you think, um, you know, our father, you know, Rufus Harley, how did he think about language from multiple angles? And, uh, and then how does his music embrace and represent uh, diverse cultures and nationalities? I know, David, you spoke on that. I know some, and we kind of, but just if you got to go a little bit further on that so that the audience can hear you know, from your perspective, um, you know, how did, you know, our father Rufus Harley think about language from, and his music from multiple angles, and then how does uh, his music embrace and represent uh, diverse cultures and nationalities? Well the, well, the linguistics of Rufus Harley is is very important. Um, he almost developed his own language within languages, within languages. It was multiple doorways and multiple dimensions. He was able to transverse because of the bagpipe, because music is really universal language. And so being um, a black man, I'm using that in racial language that's been labeled him coming from America, you were limited, you, you were within limitations. But as he went through his spiritual development, and this is what taking the bagpipes was, it was part of his spiritual journey you see his language begins to change. That's very important and it's, it's, it's phenomenal because language creates realities. And so you begin, and he begins to name himself. And so of course, when I met Sister Noah Harmony, I was like, is that your real name? <laughs> and she's like, yes, that's on my birth certificate. And she's like, well, I got a brother named Messiah in, in America and Egypt. And, I, and already I knew, okay, this man was something extraordinary because most people are ordinary or unimpressive not because they want to be but because they are afraid to go out beyond the difference to go out go out beyond the standard definition and so I think that's the legacy and that's the importance of how he used language is that once you begin to transverse into a human language as he mentioned and you begin to learn the different dimensions and the possibilities of how your words can create a different reality, you continue to transform. And everybody you touch, this is why David's a part of it, you begin to transform. And so if you ever want to see a uh, language of justice beyond the grave, that's the keys of justice right now. This is what justice looks like, seeking it beyond the grave. Um, and language uh, was important. And so therefore, when he traveled around the world, and it was so important that he did that, um, as a black man, as an African man, Native Americans, because he became an ambassador for all African black people. And they began to see, oh, these people, they are something different. They are talented, oh my goodness. They know our language, they know our talk, they know our rhythm, they could be on our vibration. So what he did was very important for us, uh, for his legacy, for his children. And he gave people a different definition of what a person, a melanated person, black African person descent is. Very phenomenal, very phenomenal. You can't get no better than that, to have a new definition. So yeah, language is, um, that's Rufus Harley. And that's part of the work I'm doing as a culture curator right now. I'm doing the ethnography of just the language of Rufus Harley and how he uses words. Okay. I think that's well said there, Tom McCall, uh, Very well said. And I know people probably have some questions on that some more because you really elaborated on that really well. Thank you so much. And then also, David, could I hear a little bit from you, the audience? I know they want to hear more of some of your insight and what you're doing and um, on your angle and just kind of the connect 
interconnectivity of how uh, you know his language and his music connected to you and also if you can address those questions too, kind of go a little bit further so the listeners and the people who are going to watch the rebroadcast to be able to you know connect more so with uh, the legacy of his music and also his his philosophy and just his um, language that he spoke. Sure. I mean, um, yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. I mean, um, you know, my, my, you know, I, 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 like a lot of bagpipers, um, especially people who play Scottish bagpipes, you know, I came through it to it because of, you know, my, my heritage, you know, I have the last name of Duncan, which is a Scottish last name. And, um, many, I think, you know, the <laughs> typical person who plays bagpipes in America has the same, um, approach, you know, wants to do it because they want to honor their heritage or what have you. But I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and it's a musical instrument, you know, and I think we're all drawn to music because of the sound and the vibrations. And I mean, know oh, that's how Rufus was drawn to the bagpipes because he heard he heard them in the in the funeral procession for um, for for John F. Kennedy. And um, you know, part of like my journey as a musician is you know because I I took the bagpipes in their cultural context to the level that I did. Now I'm you know wanting to like become creative and you know, and look for an artistic expression with something that's already traditional. And, um, you know, uh, part of that is exploring new sounds and it's exploring, you know, ways of being inspired. And, um, you know, Rufus's interpretation of what the bagpipes could be was just so, so beautiful to me. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it as um, Hamako was saying, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's his African, um, I, idea of what of what the bagpipes could be and I mean coming from the culture that the bag the Scottish bagpipes are from you know it's it's a different approach and I just you know I, I really enjoy it for its for its for its just it's 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 it, it really it's beautiful and um yeah and uh you know you know cross-cultural um understandings of of music I think are important for you know just coming together and um Music has a way of doing that and bringing people together. You know, it's, it, it is, I think it is one of those common languages, you know, the fact that we can all relate to sound and vibrations and, you know, despite the cultural context, you know, I think, you know, music has the power to unite us. And I think Rufus certainly embodied that. Do, do you hear, thank you so much, David. Well, well said on that. And do you think that uh, when you hear the, the music, both for you, Tom and also David, when he uh, speaks about his philosophy and his language and his music, do you feel as if, uh, you know, he's playing on bagpipes, do you feel like he's kind of speaking for the silence and, um, and by exposing the kind of the injustices or the torturing effects uh, of, of those who have been oppressed uh, in various cultures and nationalities? Can you hear that coming through the music on, on that end when he's blowing the bagpipes? Do you feel like, do you, do, you, do you hear empathy? Do you hear him uh, speaking up for the silence, for the uh, people who are oppressed, the marginalized communities? Uh, could you guys elaborate on that, kind of what you're hearing when he when the sounds do come through? Yeah, you can definitely hear that because as we know, and, and Dave was pointing out, and this is what Rufus Hart, uh, when he saw the Kennedy procession, he saw something he never seen. Because remember, you you young, you black, you poor in Philly, you come out the South, you have very limited education, which means limited exposure. So when he saw that, that was that blew him away. But then what he heard tapped into something. And he never heard anything like that. And so he said, I have to do something too. I want to do something. So he was able in his brain to connect that this sound, I need to cry out to the highest person that can give justice. And so, as we know, it's a chant, the sound of it, but also it's a mantra, um, which is like a sacred part of that definition means God and spirit. So who better to go to the highest person than the divine himself, right? And so he said, I'm not going to do, I, I ain't going to be in the marches, ain't going to go knock somebody over the head, you know, but I'm going to put this skirt on, <laughs> I'm going to get this bagpipe, you know, I'm going to get this tamarind, I'm going to put these flags on here. And I want to go to the highest vibration. And so the bagpipe for him and how he modified it, he was able to send that to the highest person that he felt and can uh, bring justice. And so uh, the sound that he was able to produce, it came from within him. And that comes from within his DNA, which he passes on to anything seed that comes out of him. 
And so um, that's why I say when he picked it up, it was no different than his ancestors in the plantations across the country. They cried out, they sung them blues. David talked about the blues and the jazz, all that comes out of the oppression of the people, the injustice, but out of that is a beautiful struggle. And that's what the divine hears, right? And that's what made him free his people in Israel, right? The Israelites eventually, you know, this, this sound, this sound, this sound. And so it's very powerful and very potent um, that this sound continues to play and that it must be played. It must continue to play and reverberate around the world. Everybody should have this, in particular people that look like Rufus Harley because they got to be on tune. They have to get in rhythm. And I think that's the message and justice. And he said it earlier on what Rufus Harvey was talking. He said, my right side, he said, now we're in balance. That's what justice is, is balance. And so he was able to achieve that when he picked the bagpipe and when he played, you know, he was calling out to God. He said, I'm giving you up this prayer. And this is my prayer. This is my chant. The angels here, the God here. You can't get no higher than that. So most definitely. I just... If I don't, if you don't mind me jumping in, I just love what um, Tomiko just said. I mean, about the bagpipes as a chant. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, I was listening, you know, when I, was, when I listened to um, the final uh, uh, part of uh, A Love Supreme by John Coltrane, you know, he actually uses his saxophone to pray. And he actually, you know, does that, you know, with, with and that's actually like the prayer that he wrote is in the liner notes of the album, which is amazing. Uh, but you know what's kind of unique about the bagpipes is that there's so much vibration because you're playing four reeds at once and all these harmonic overtones and stuff. I mean, it is a very powerful sound and it's moving. And like, you know, when when Rufus used it to, exp you know, as a form of expression, the way that he did, it just kind of amplified like what is so unique about the instrument itself and like those vibrations and those, those harmonics and just the richness of the sound. I mean, when he used it to express, you know, his struggle and his his experience in the world, it, I just think, you know, it, you know, I, I mean, you know, I always say, I, I you know, I don't, I don't think it, it ever been done like that before. And I know, you know, as, as a musician and somebody who, you know, tries to express himself artistically and creatively, it really spoke to me personally. You guys just uh, answered the next questions I was going to ask you <laughs> on there, but um, I'm, in, in my class, I'm, I'm reading, um, I'm in the Flint Hills International writing project from Emporia State University right now. I'm a Flint Hills uh, International uh, Writing Fellow. And uh, one of the books that I'm uh, reading is uh, called uh, Content Area Conversations. And I just started it. And um, one thing that I gleaned from there, it talked about the power of conversations and how in education, how you know it goes all the way back to the straight deaths and kids you know, looking straight ahead and how there's not enough conversation being encouraged in the classroom where you know, the teacher kind of just delivers the content and, you know, kids don't have not a lot of opportunities to have conversations. And, um, and also talked about in the beginning of this um, book, uh, it was written by actually Douglas, um, Douglas Fisher, Nancy Fry, and, uh, and uh, Carl uh, Rothenberg is the, is the book. It's called Content Area Conversations and reading for the Flint Hills International Writing Project. And um, one thing I talked about in the introduction by um, Shirley Bryce Heath, um, she talked about the length and the width and, the, and, and also the depth of all that we can learn. And, and um, do, do you guys hear that in a sense, like our father kind of pushing the conversation a little bit further? I know Dizzy Gillespie was doing it. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie, um, you know, Louis Armstrong. And some of the big band era, you know, those guys, they would get up there and have these conversations. But um, later, there were some other people like Miles Davis who felt like, hey, you know, let the music speak for itself. You know, he would just go up there and play. And but you also had other people like our father who went deeper into the music because of the instrument that he had. He went a little bit further. And then you had Dizzy Gillespie, who, you know, who was a great humanitarian, but he also spoke. He had. You know, it's his bright personality. You had Louis Armstrong who would just, you know, not only would he play the music, but he would sit down and have dialogues with people from all the way from the top to the bottom. But um, I'm kind of seeing, I'm kind of noticing that with, with technology um, and then with uh, the kind of the information age, what, what I've been noticing, what I've been, been observing is that um, I'm noticing that, um, and this is also, this is kind of a global question in a sense, um, that there's not enough conversation 
being uh, going on with between humans from back back and forth. And I know we're doing a social distance. Uh, we are working hard to do that, but I'm noticing that in the classroom and also in different professions, um, you know, there's not enough conversation that embraces the the length, the 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 width, and also the depth going down deep into those deep conversations to really connect us, interconnect us as human beings so that we can look at uh, things as far as how, how do we end war? How, how, how do we uh, end food deserts? And how do we uh, reframe a question in a different way to spark a deeper curiosity? Or how, how do we solve these issues? And I, I'm kind of, from my perspective, I feel like we're, we're not engaging in those deeper level conversations to where uh, people are really able to tap into that those uh, those deeper levels as if our father was doing with his music. And of course he was doing it during the civil rights era where you know people that wasn't allowed for a lot of people to be speaking out like that. And he would really tap on some issues that people wanted to hear and some people didn't want to hear. But can you guys just kind of elaborate on the importance of conversation, whether it be in music, whether it be in engineering or you're a scientist or whether you are in government or politics, wherever field you're in, could you talk about the power of just the conversation and how it can really um, uh, be used more on a deeper uh, platform to help uh, grow education and also help grow an individual and also help to just unite different cultures in a sense. Well, I was interested in hearing you talk about, um, that's an interesting question, it's, um, it's very layered um, cause you think about the word dialogue and that's what, uh, dialogue is dialogue is pulling out the layers. They call some call the art of dialogue. Um, Paulo Freire and pedagogy, of the press talks about the art of dialogue in order to dialogue, flush out words and languages you can get to the heart of matters. Um, and I think, I believe you're right, uh, America, that is not happening enough. This human connection, human conversations. And that's why we have such, we're in an era of mediocrity. But at the same time, we're in a paradigm energy shift um, where we're trying to go beyond mediocrity. And so you see with Rufus Harley, his conversations of death and breath, just in the names that you all have, his children, right? In that one word, in those names is the breath and death of oceans. Because when a parent names his child, he's saying he wants them to be more than what they are, more than what the world ever thought they could be. And so what that involves is kind of what Rufus Harley did was like a spiritual type of development and constant, you write, conversation and talking to the divine and self and those who are higher consciousness. And so, yes, yeah, definitely lacking in the schools. Um, I know I do a radio show and I was with a very deep guest the other day. She's Dr. Healer World Renowned. And she said, I'm going to call in. I'm going to be on my laptop and we're going to talk. I said, no, we don't do it like that. I said, you need to be on the phone so the audience can hear your voice. I said, because they need to hear the sound, the vibration, because they can, so they can feel you. And so I think um, where you, you pushing this, uh, America, and, and with Rufus Harley did, we have to get back to the soul of the matter, to the human part of who we are. Um, and I think that's a profound lesson. I think it's an excellent question. It's a lot in that. Um, but these human conversations, you put it, it's the flushing out of self and who we are is definitely needed. And this is what Rufus Harley did constantly. He was having an affair with this bagpipe, this woman. And you know, when you're in a relationship, man, woman, you definitely always talking. You always reproducing because it's just so good. Ain't nothing, nothing better than that, than a, a good man, a good woman. And so this is what Rufus Harley did. And so um, I think this is part of his uh, mission for us. We have to continue that. Uh, I'd love to jump in here. Um... Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. I mean, it, yeah, it's very, like um, Tomiko said, it's very layered, um, you know, and, um, you know, I, th I think, uh, you know, I, I totally, I mean, I agree with this, the, the, the idea that these conversations are necessary, like, and we're in a time where we're, 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 we are starting to have these conversations. But looking at this album, I mean, this was 1998, and Rufus was out there saying this in 1998. And like, you know, like, you know, you know, like listening to some of this stuff, I mean, like some of this stuff isn't, totally comfortable to hear, you know, as like a person of European descent. I mean, you know, like I'm um, talking about, you know, the, the, the use of the word right, R-I-T-E, and, you know, being like, um, you know, as he says in the album and saying, you know, I, you know, he takes it on, he takes it head on. 
like this this you know these these ideas of race and 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 privilege and you know and it's like yeah it's 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 a little bit jarring to hear you know like you know from from my perspective but it's necessary and like you know i'm learning this through my work with like a local protest group you know where like you know there's books to read you know like you know white fragility takes it on and there's another another one called you know being anti-racist that i've learned about and it's like you know these conversations in order to get to a higher plane of understanding are necessary and they're uncomfortable but that's kind of what makes you able to grow from having them i think is challenge you know confronting the uncomfortableness and being willing to grow and learn Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, uh, appreciate it. <laughs> very, very insightful. Very insightful. Learn a lot. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I'll pass it back over to Noah. Um, thank you so much, guys, for engaging in that dialogue there. Very profound. And I know it's just a layer that we're evolving to. <laughs> we're evolving to higher levels. Um, all of us are. And then, you know, of course, we have um, Sonny Rollins back here, down here at the bottom, the, the Cutting Edge album. He was one of our father's mentors and our father's on that album playing back. He's on this record playing with Sonny Rollins. And he really, really looked up to Sonny Rollins and he was the mentor to him as well as his teacher. Our father's teacher was Dennis Sandoli, who was a Jewish American uh, Italian guitarist who gave a lot of theory lessons to a lot of uh, musicians like James Moody, Charlie Parker, John Coltrane. A lot of guys came to him for theory lessons down in Philadelphia at the time. And he would really help uh, them out. But uh, Sonny Rollins was really, I want to just give a shout out to him. I don't know if he's watching or not from New York or anything, but, you know, he's one of our movers and shakers and sustainers. But he believed in our father and he uh, took him on several tours throughout Europe. And uh, eventually they he recorded that album with uh, our father, the, the Cutting Edge. And he uh, really believed in him and he kind of exposed him to uh, some of his um audiences in, in europe and he also exposed them to greater fans and i and and i think it's really important that in music and jazz artists you know we at heart we love to share <laughs> and sometimes we like to share too much but uh we we love to share because that's what music is it, it naturally there's a dna within music itself that connects us that unites us and and, and sonny rollins being so gracious to share the bandstand with with our father who was playing the bagpipes and not kind of feeling as if, you know, he's taking up too much space. I think that's a good lesson for a lot of uh, younger artists or different athletes or people who are, you know, just in different uh, avenues who, where they have this thing where it's only run for one leader or kind of like that. And I understand people have different leadership styles, but I think it's a good lesson for us to talk about the power of sharing our gifts and, and being able to um, give, give a part of ourself to somebody else and and be able to decrease for a moment and let them know that, you know, I'm one of the greatest tenor saxophones in the world. And me and Sonny, uh, me and John Coltrane, Dexter Gordon, we're all like, you know, neck, you know, neck to neck and, you know, and, and Stan Getz and all these guys who were up there, you know, playing and, and Joe Lovano, he had all these great tenor giants and stuff who were just doing amazing things. And, but, you know, the thing was, is just like these guys, all, a lot of these guys were able to share their gifts with the world and then share with each other. And I think a lot of these guys, uh, through the power of sharing, from my perspective, I think it increases our health, our mental health. I think it increases our, uh, our lifespan and it also increases our, uh, our, our, our intuition. And I think Sonny Rollins, you know, I know he's, he's doing really well now, but I just want to share that with the world that Sonny Rollins, he's also another mover shaker, another guy who has been so unselfish to share his gift and knowledge with the world. And I think we should listen to people like that more so and give them a listen ear, you know, where a lot of people are kind of want the quick, a lot of artists want the, uh, they want to rise to stardom quick, or I want to become this great sensation. But these artists like Sonny Rollins, you know, Coltrane, you know, Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis and those guys, and uh, Lee Morgan, you know, uh, it's so many, all the artists, you know, and, and Charlie Parker, they all had to go through changes in life and they had to overcome those changes. And the ones who were able to have the mental capacity to block out all of the noise that's going on saying that you can't become this or you 
you don't um, you're not good enough to become this they were able to have the the strength and the mental capacity to block out the naysayers and say you know what i may not be there yet but i'm keep searching i'm gonna keep growing and i'm gonna keep evolving and at one point at some point i'm going to get to my destiny to where i need to be in life and i think that's just a lesson of what we're all what we're doing right now is just a testimony to that so i'll hand it back over to noah and uh so we can move forward with that but thank you so much guys okay thank you all again thank you all again for joining us um and just speaking so eloquently and beautifully bringing the words together uh from my dad rufus harley and um really just breaking down his language just a little bit today. This is a three-part series. Let me just say this uh, quickly. This is a, a three-part discussion that we will be um, uh, having every, let's say, uh, 30 or 60 days. So this is something that we are not, because Rufus had a culture within himself, his, his music uh, interpretation and his language was a culture within, him, within itself as Sister Tomiko and I uh, laugh all the time about it, or not so much laugh about it, but more so just, you know, how can we really break down this, this man's culture and how can we deliver it to the conscious, the collective consciousness of mankind today? And um, today it was such a vast amount of information that was given from Rufus's side through his platform of music and his philosophy and the dialogue behind it and the interconnectivity of all of the nationalities here in America. And now till even just this uh, round table right here, first of all, we are operating with within three to four different time zones at this very time with just these amount of people that are in the line. So how we're bridging ourselves technologically and virtually and digitally, this is the new age and where it is that we are. And now we have to take this cultural language <laughs> from Rufus Harley musically and uh, collectively and bridge, continue to bridge these cultures together. So I'm so grateful that you all could join us today and um, you know, just really identify with again, Rufus Harley, uh, an international jazz ambassador of music, culture and freedom and um, the world's first and uh, you know, the world's first jazz bagpiper. And uh, I, I'm so grateful that you all were on the line today. Truly, I'm so grateful that you all were on the line. So as we're coming to our close, our final, final of everything, if we don't have any more questions to our round table um, discussers, or if we don't have anything else to say, I uh, just wanted to inform you all about the Rufus Harley Foundation and, and where it is that we're heading and where we're going, our intention. I'll read exactly where it is that we are. Just give me one moment. Um, let's see. Did you so have a PowerPoint you were going to share too, Noah? Did you have a PowerPoint you were going to share with this? Um, yeah, I do have a PowerPoint. Let's see. I do have a PowerPoint. Let me see, let me see. Okay, let me share my screen. And this PowerPoint is just a few pictures of Rufus um, and his son, uh, Messiah, and just some of the people that he has come up um, to come across in his, uh, what do you call it, in his, uh, throughout his career. So if you could just bear with me for one second, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So we're just gonna play this quickly. So this is just Rufus Harley. <laughs> and these are just some of a few pictures. This is a original art piece of artwork that he has drawn and it's on the cover of the Keys of Justice. And these uh, are the Can I say something about that cover and the album there? Sure. Again, for the listeners. Yeah, that album, that's our father's artwork. And I did not know that he was talking about Keys of Justice and he said that you know, years before he passed to me in the family. And as I was going through the pictures, I was thinking about what was he talking about? And um, as I look at the keys, you know, and people holding our hands up, and we think about what's going on in society today with justice and some of the injustice against um, minorities and people who are being marginalized. I thought that was very kind of interesting that he was kind of already 
Uh, of course, that's been going on for a long time already, but I, I thought that was really cool that, that he was drawing an art about some of the injustices that were going on. She had the guys holding her keys up, uh, sorry, holding her hands up with the keys going through their air there. Um, and then you also have them kind of, some of them kind of running, but you also have the keys there. So this that artwork there is a original artwork from our father that he did. And um, all we did was add the colors and enhancements with uh, Mr. Craig Lindsay when we were working on the album. But I thought that was very cool that he would do that. And again, for those of you guys who don't know the artists on the album, that's Bill Anchell on piano. He can be reached at BillAnchell.com. Uh, and then you have um, Messiah Patton Harley on trumpet and the flugelhorn. Um, and then you have Neil Starkey on bass. And then you have Rufus Harley on the bagpipes and Baby Soprano on this particular album. Okay, okay thank you, America, for that. So this is just a uh, a picture of Rufus. Um, he would oftentimes, uh, you know, sign a picture. This is, I believe, a picture in front of our our childhood home. Also, just to give one quick credit, Rufus uh, was a male midwife and he delivered his children at home. So we were all born at home and, um, you know, it, it was a, a cult, Rufus was a culture within himself. So that's a, that's just an old archive picture. This is Rufus and Muhammad Ali showing him how to, you know, blow the bagpipes, you know, um, it was just <laughs> a very interesting time a black man playing the bagpipes of African, uh, uh, African and, uh, Cherokee descent playing a bagpipe. So a lot of people at that time were just intrigued by Rufus's uh, uh, innovation. This is Rufus and Ray Charles together sitting on the couch. You know, and I, I, I'm not aware of which show this is, but this is, a, 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 I believe, a talk show. So yeah, this is just- Ray Charles had a, a live show in Philadelphia at the time. And then, um, you know, he would bring on several guests and uh, that's from his show, the Ray Charles Live show. He bring it, he used to interview different guests. So that's where that particular picture is from, from his uh, show that he had during his days when he was in Philadelphia. Because as you, many of you guys know, Philadelphia was kind of a jazz, kind of a jazz mecca in a sense. A lot of people came through Philadelphia as they did, you know, back in the day when they came to Kansas City, where I'm at. You know, of course, Kansas City is where jazz grew up at. You know, it, it was birthed in Congo Square. But in Kansas is where it, jazz grew up and matured. Then, you know, of course, later it kind of went further north to Chicago and, and, and west and some of those other places and up to up north. But in Philly, it was a really good place. You had the showboat going on downtown. You had was a, a big time jazz venue where a lot of the jazz artists were playing at. That's where you know, our father, you know, uh, taught, him and John Coltrane did shows together. And then uh, Rashad Roland Kirk. They were a lot of a lot of cats were going through that to the showboat. It was a it was a big jazz club in Philadelphia at the time. Lee Morgan, uh, just uh, an array of cats came through that area, and of course a lot of people think that you know the home where John Coltrane's house in West Philly is where all of them kind of ran the streets together when they were like teenagers and boys and stuff. And this is of course before jazz was in the conservatories and the schools and everything where these guys were creating a language for music itself. Um, of course, John Coltrane later um, did move out of that home, which is the house is still there in, in Philadelphia, but he did move to New York. And that's his house is now a part of the historic preservation, National Trust Heritage uh, Foundation, where people can go and tour it. But a lot of people think that he wrote the Love Supreme at the home in Philly. He probably began it, uh, or he probably started it there, but it was in that home there in uh, New York. And I always thought originally that he wrote it there at his house in Philadelphia, but where he uh, wrote the music for A Love Supreme and all of his notes and everything, a lot of the com composing for that music, a lot of writing was done up in the attic upstairs in that home in uh, New York. But again, back to that picture, that is a uh, Ray Charles live show there in Philadelphia. And they did several shows together, live shows. Thank you so much, America, for your historic perspective. You are, <laughs> you know, you're a historian by uh, nature and by trade. So thank you so much for that. Um, and this is uh, another picture of Rufus Harley on the Mike Douglas show. Uh, he was a guest appearance in there with uh, Joan Rivers. 
and they were asking him about, you know, his bagpipe usage. And as you see in her hand, that was his album, The Recreation of the Gods. I know you all heard earlier when I was playing uh, Etymology from The Recreation of the Gods. So this is that album right there in her hand. Um, this is a picture of Rufus uh, Messiah Harley with Grover Washington. And you see Messiah with his trumpet and flugelhorn. Uh, that was very, uh, you know, keen on all of us being musically inclined and understanding who our musical greats were and would also give us a platform and exposure to these people. And Messiah had the privilege to travel internationally, nationally with, with our dad to, um, you know, continue the legacy. So these are just a few pictures. Messiah and our father on stage, you know, um, excellent trumpeter, excellent, excellent trumpeter. And this is Messiah and Wynton Marcellus. Again, Rufus and Messiah performing. Uh, they would be famous. They would call our father for so many different uh, uh, events nationally, internationally to open these events um, and be the representation uh, nationally and just from the origin of Philadelphia to represent culture and freedom. Again, uh, there's a picture of Messiah and our brother America and our father Rufus. And you can explain a little bit about that America as well, um, that where this picture is. This picture was when I was at Coffeeville Community College, um, when I was during my football years. Um, I did, I didn't actually, uh, I never announced my retirement after I did semi-pro, but <laughs> no, I'm just saying, but no, this is um, when I was at Coffeeville Community College. At that time, I was, uh, got a scholarship there and I was in the, the pet band, the jazz band and uh, also in choir there, but I played free safety there. I played with Brandon Jacobs. He was there from the New York Giants who played with Eli Manning, uh, Ryan Lilja, Willie Ponder, uh, Daryl Sharpshire, you know, um, there was a bunch of, uh, Shante, uh, a bunch, we had a lot of different athletes that came through Coffeeville. Of course, Buster Douglas came through, the boxer came through, Coffeeville Community College, uh, Mike Rogier, uh, Kurt Schoenheimer, Marty Schoenheimer's athlete brother. Um, there were all types of athletes that came. I mean, the list goes on. But uh, when I was at Coffeeville playing free safety there, um, you know, pops came down from Philly. I was like, hey, uh, would you be, would you come down and perform for our, for the student body? And, um, you know, I asked the school and, and they called up, you know, pops and, they worked it out. They flew him into Coffeeville and he performed for the whole football team. And he came down and met all of the coaches and athletes and, and they uh, spent a few days down there in Coffeeville. And um, it was very cool. Um, he invited me up to play like a few songs with him. And uh, he interviewed at the campus when he was there. And it was just a very memorable experience. But um, him coming all the way from Philadelphia all the way to Coffeeville to do a concert, which was I thought was really cool. He would do that a lot too for Noah. He came to her college. He also came to McPherson College um, to perform. And he probably would have continued to do that. And one thing about our father that a lot of you guys don't know, he was real passionate about sharing information and breaking down the the music into uh, digestible bites so people could understand it. And he was not too much concerned about kind of protecting, you know, um, his music in a sense to where it's like, this is only like my gift. He wanted to share it with everyone. He wanted, he was more concerned about the education side of it. You know, he was very, very con concerned about uh, allowing for the music to go forth educationally so that the next generation of people can continue to learn. And that was kind of uh, part of the, one of the things that he did throughout his career. Uh, he would do lots of workshops, um, he would go to a lot of schools and just he would you know, play all over, which I know a lot of artists do that today also, too. But um, he was very much concerned about um, getting his music out there to the world, which I think is real cool. OK, thank you. And this is the last slide. 
for today. This is this is our father in his latter year of playing the bagpipes. And as you see, his last set of bagpipes, he had uh, his bagpipes uh, stitched um, all of the national, uh, international and national flags from around the world etched onto his bagpipes, symbolizing how we are all interconnected, how inside of the bag, it breathes and it holds all of humanity. So this is what he was representing at the end of his career. This is his last set of bagpipes. So, um, and I think that very, picture says something, Noah. Um, I think it says something about our father's evolution as a human being to start kind of from, you know, he was born in Wake County, North Carolina. And he always tell people to wake up, you know, <laughs> Wake County, right outside of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, also John Coltrane was born in North Carolina. Uh, 10 years before our father in 1926. Our father was born in 1936 in Wake County, North Carolina, outside of Raleigh. But it's interesting to see how he evolved to where, even though he was, you know, lived in a certain place, he he expanded his horizon. And I know the David and Tom and Cole, and we discussed this a little bit earlier, but I thought that was really cool because so many times, so many people um, are born into this world and they have, they're stuck on one group of people and they don't evolve to embrace all the cultures. They just say that they have a feeling as if, you know, it's only my people, we're the chosen group, <laughs> it's only us. And people have these, these mindsets and these ideas are out there, which is so um, elementary in my, in my mindset to see how people can stay stuck in one dimension throughout their entire lives. They'd be here 80 years and it's, feeling as if they're the only individual and that there no one else exists in this world, you know, other than their group of people. But our father, he have constantly evolved and say, you know what, I may be African-American Cherokee of Cherokee descent, born in, you know, Wake County, North Carolina, but I'm not just defined to one uh, ethnicity. That's not who I am. And he represented that not only in his heart, but he represented that, of course, as Tom McCall and David and Noah mentioned earlier, he represented that in his music. He represented that in his language and his, and his, his and the very way that he lived his life. And that picture right there is just a testimony to where he ended up. He got it right. So many people would be afraid to kind of embrace all different nationalities and put the flags at different places in, um, into their heart, into their culture, into their career. But our father said, you know what, we're all connected. You know, we have more in common than we, we don't have in common. And he did not, he, our father, and this is just a, I think an ending question if we have time, Noah, to ask Tom McCall and uh, David and also you, uh, is just how, how did our father's music and personal journey travel from the, the known to the unknown? And um, you guys don't have to answer that, but just, just a question I wanted to throw out there to the panelists. Uh, David, you want to uh, take? I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question um, from the from the known uh, to the unknown. Well, yeah, what I, uh, how, how did our father's music and personal journey travel to the known, uh, K-N-O-W-N, and then to the unknown, and I, what, in, in terms of that question, I'm talking about, you know, uh, going places to where, um, you know, are not familiar, or, or journey into, and now you guys asked, answered that earlier, but um, just wanted to hear from another perspective from those people who were not on earlier, and they're just tuning in to the conversation, uh, that way they can kind of glean uh, from the conversation and connect back to what you guys were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I'd love to take this, take this, uh, take, you know, share my, my perspective. I mean, you know, the known context of, of, of a traditional instrument, the Scottish bagpipes, you know, it exists. Um, it's very one dimensional when, you know, seen through like a specific cultural context, but, you know, at the end of the day, it is, it's, it's an instrument, you know what I mean? And, and it's, it's a form of expression and like what the artist brings to that is what it becomes. And Rufus brought his, you know, his worldview, his background, his, you know, his struggles, the black person in America, his, you know, his roots in the African diaspora, things that I don't, 
you know, necessarily understand, but he embodied that and brought it to an instrument that, you know, already had a cultural context, but he made it his own. And he brought other people into that world, which is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I think um, you can see, and this is an excellent picture to end with, um, how he did bring that from the known uh, to the unknown, known, no knowledge that's within that word, the language of that word. And it's written in all the Egyptian temples um, as a man thinketh, you know, we could say as a woman thinking, so he, she is, you know. And so Rufus Harley, it was interesting, he used the bagpipe as access, kind of like as a gateway into the unknown as far as his spiritual development, as far as maybe things, places he had never imagined, never seen. But that was, he trusted it enough, the bagpipes and the sound and who it connected to, what it connected to, to take him into the unknown at first, but it became known to him. And that's how he became more of who he was. And so we see him going through the process. It's kind of like, it's the friction. It's, that's how pearls are made, in particular Tahitian pearls. It takes about two or three years for a Tahitian black pearl uh, to be developed. Um, at one time, only the royal family wore black pearls. Uh, Tahitian pearls. They didn't give it to the common people. They wore white pearls. And so in Tahiti, the Tahitian pearl is, they say, it's, it's a conversation between man and God. And the Tahitians, they have to have it underneath the water. It takes a couple of years. And once it just opens, it's this beautiful, amazing black pearl. And it's because of the friction. And so we see in, in his traveling and all the different uh, sacrifices he had to make and the commitment, that friction it was something beautiful. And after a while, it wasn't unknown anymore. And I think that's part of the fear that most people have. And I think you have to not run away from that friction or that conflict, but go to it. And this is what you finally have. <laughs> this is what you presented with. <laughs> you get a Rufus Harley still teaching us and now he knows, so now we know. And then we can tell somebody else and everything becomes known. Yeah, very powerful. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, well said, thank you. Well said, God. thank you so much, guys. Yes. And I'm pretty sure our listeners and audiences are um, really enjoying this. And again, you guys can post questions after it's over during the conversation. And um, we really appreciate you guys. And please watch the free broadcast. Um, hope that you guys will. And then share this, repost it to your page. Um, let people know about the album, Keys of Justice, that is out there. Um, it will be available for, uh, for download here shortly and you also can purchase the physical artifact of the cd which i think is even better by contacting noah harmley at rufusharley.com or reaching out to bill anchel uh, um, at billanchel.com okay thank you america okay so this is it um i'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now and um, again, we're coming to a close of this beautiful program. And um, I'm just going to read briefly to you just some of the mission, vision, purpose statement for the Rufus Harley Foundation. And then we'll cl close out with um, one last number from Rufus, uh, if you all could just. Uh, uh, so. The Rufus Harley Foundation. The Rufus Harley Foundation, the musical jazz legacy of ancestor Rufus Harley will be reintroduced to listeners throughout the world through the Rufus Harley Foundation. The Rufus Harley Foundation will be composed of programming and activities that usher from and build on a foundation of Rufus Harley musical philosophy of peace, love, freedom, and harmony. The purpose is to preserve Harley's music for educational purpose and for the next generation of musicians around the world. E equity, diversity, and inclusion through indigenous artists who seek create a sustainable, economical, and peaceful united society. The mission is to continue the work of Rufus Harley and his philosophy and belief of liberty and freedom to the nation, delivering it through his music, particularly through the bagpipes and the Liberty Bell to be extended to affect change and people's narratives into one of unity and dignity. And the vision is to grow up a new generation of ambassadors of culture and freedom 
through the Rufus Harley Philosophy of Justice, Liberty, and Freedom by marrying jazz and universalism with young people that will be taught to create a sustaining new world that is human and beneficial for everyone. So again, you know, this is uh, our intent behind the Rufus uh, Harley Foundation, and we will be successful in our pursuits and moving forward with the legacy of Rufus Harley. So again, I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna close out with uh, one last piece from Rufus. And um, if you all could just hold tight again, thank you all so much. If you need any information regarding the Keys of Justice, it was mentioned to you by my brother America. Uh, you can reach us on the rufusharley.com page. There you will find information for the Rufus Harley Foundation and the legacy in which it is that we're doing. And uh, also the album, um, and where we could send you the album and those types of things. So thank you again so much for joining us today uh, on this two hour uh, round table discussion of Keys of Justice album. And I'm so grateful that you all could join us again today and take this time out on your busy Saturday. And um, you know, you can all get back to your regular schedule uh, programs. So one last thing, let me uh, do this right here, let's see. Okay, one second. I'm going to share my screen. And this is just Rufus closing us out for today. So thank you all so much again for joining us. And this is the Rufus Harley Quintet at Jazz Till Sunrise here in Florida. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the close of our program. And be, please be on the lookout for our part two series of Keys of Justice, our discussion, and we'll have a few other uh, musicians and uh, jazz artists on the line. And we look forward to hearing from you all. And thank you all again so much for joining us today. And um, be on the lookout for more information on rufusharley.com. Thank you all so much. <laughs>